All right, chapter 20, electrochemistry. So we'll be talking about current, voltage, electricity, and electricity happening or having to do with chemical reactions, which is the chemistry part of electro. Now, um, there's current and electron movement. And really what current is, is it's measured in amps, which we'll see that. And it's the flow of electron, the measure of the flow of electrons from negative to positive. And there are certain reactions where we actually learned about them already called redox reactions that involve the flow of electrons from a cathode or sorry, an anode to a cathode or a negative end to a positive end. But also, I mean, we could talk about electrons flow in general terms with lightning, right? And also batteries, we'll learn about more about batteries later. We'll see diagrams, but for lightning, the way lightning occurs is you have a cloud, right? And then the cloud, and I'll, I'll draw, hold on, let me draw things. All right, so you have a cloud, right? Stormy cloud, bad cloud, right? And in the cloud, you have water vapor. The water vapor is at the bottom of the cloud. What happens over time is the water vapor, it moves up because it's light. And I mean, it, and also because of um, the, the pressure, in the cloud, there's internal pressure here that pushes the water vapor particles upward, right? Then once the water vapor is up in the top of the cloud, it loses that energy and it actually condenses and it condenses into what we call soft hail, soft hail. So in every rainstorm, in every lightning strike, there's actually hail, hail involved. So ice, but it doesn't fall down as hail because you don't see it, right? It's not, it's not a hailstorm all the time. Um, there's just, every time there's lightning, there's not a hailstorm, but there's actually what we call soft hail that's in the cloud. And so this, uh, the, the, the water particles will condense and form these little hail particles. Then they will get so heavy that they will no longer be held up by the pressure of the cloud, which means they'll start to fall down to the bottom of the cloud. When they do, they will bump into water molecules that are going up to become hail. So you have a bombardment. This bombardment, it exchanges electrons. So the electrons are actually exchanged from the hail particles, or sorry, from the water particles to the, to the, the vapor to the hail. So the hail becomes negatively charged and it goes to the bottom. So that means the bottom of the cloud becomes negatively charged and the top of the cloud becomes positively charged. This creates an electron gradient. The electron gradient is what causes um, a, a polarization, right? We've heard of this word before, partial negative, partial positive, polarization. And it happens within molecules as well, right? We know polar molecules. So what happens is this negative charge keeps building up to a point where the forces inside that are keeping the cloud together can no longer hold the negatives in there. And a discharge must, must happen. The discharge will discharge the negative electrons to any nearby positive charge or relatively positive charge, which the air happens to be relatively positive in comparison to the bottom of the cloud. And the pathway that it takes is the most energetically favorable pathway. It's not always straight down. It's through the air in whichever way it wants to go. That's why lightning strike usually looks like all crazy patterns like that, because it just, it's a current of, it's a current that's taking the, that's conducting the most energetically efficient way possible to the ground. And technically the ground is negatively charged, but the air above the ground is positively charged. So, it, I mean, lightning strikes go mostly, they don't go directly to the ground. They go to usually, if there's, you know, it's um, never to go near it, never hold anything that's metal when, when there's lightning, right? Because the light, then the, the metal will, have a positive charge, slight positive charge from your hand and from um, static electricity. And then that will conduct the lightning better than the ground would. The ground's negative. So that's why, I mean, I've play, been playing baseball my whole life. And every time there's not even rain, just one lightning strike, that's even in a distant a distance, everybody has to get off the field because you were dealing with, and I mean, at least in high school, now I play with wood bats, but you're dealing with metal bats. And even with, there's like metal fences. So like anything can happen. 
Um, anyway, that's how lightning occurs. And batteries, we will talk about the transition of electrons from the anode to the cathode as we go forward. So that's pretty cool, meteorology lesson. Um, so um, these reactions that are in the battery and, and also the other reactions that we're going to talk about are our redox reactions. So we're not going to go crazy in depth on redox because we should already know it. But for in short, oil rig, right? Remember oil rig? So you have oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction is gaining electrons. Very important. So an example of oxidation is you have sodium metal is being oxidized, meaning it's losing an electron and becoming positively charged. Chlorine in this case is being reduced in this reaction. And it's going from Cl2, which is an inert gas. You're adding two electrons, meaning it's gaining two electrons to become the ion 2Cl minus or Cl minus, but two of them. So, uh, and also we, we know our oxidation states. It's important to assign those oxidation states even in this chapter. So some of the chem one is going to come back to chem two into, into redox reactions. Uh, another thing that's important is, let's look at this, the metal oxidation real quick. And we're gonna be talking about this later. So for a metal oxidation, <laughs> Think about what's happening. You have a solid metal and it's losing an electron and the product is the ionic form. The ionic form of the metal is in solution. It dissolves. So that's important. If you have a metal that is oxidized in a reaction and it becomes charged in the product, that and it's aqueous, that means it's dissolved. That's another word for dissolving. And we're going to be seeing, we're going to be investigating based on electrochemical potentials of different metals, which ones dissolve in certain acids. That's what we're going to learn. That's one of the skills we're going to learn today. And you can tell that from um, dissolving, all that means is does it oxidize into an ion? Because the ions, if you touch like a piece of, a piece of iron, you're not going to get a charge. You're not going to get a, a shock from it, right? It's neutrally charged because it's in a solid form. Once it becomes aqueous, then it's in its ionic form. Okay, so then we have our half reactions, which we've seen before. So you can have an entire redox full reaction, and you can split that into half reactions, our oxidation half and our reduction half. And we'll do examples of this when we learn how to balance them. So that's the first skill we're going to learn is how to balance redox reactions. And they are different than balancing regular reactions. There's actually a a important stepwise method on how to do it. Because if you balance it like you normally would, redox reactions are tough. You probably won't do it correctly or it might take some time. Um, but if you do, the charges might be uneven in the left and the right side. And you can't have an uneven number of charges on left and right because where does that charge go? So here's the steps on how to do it. And we're gonna do three examples together. So the first thing we wanna do when we're balancing redox is we're going to assign oxidation states and we're gonna write the half reactions. So that those should go hand in hand because we know from chem one, you assign oxidation states. That means you can tell which elements are being oxidized, which ones are being reduced. And also for extra credit, which ones are being the oxidizing agent, which ones are being the reducing agent, right? Then they go, they're, um, they're the opposites, right? Meaning if something is being oxidized, it is the reducing agent. It causes the other thing to be reduced by giving the electrons to the thing that's being reduced and vice versa with the reducing agent or with the oxidizing agent. Um, anyway, so you're going to write the oxidation and reduction half reactions, meaning you're going to split the total reaction into its oxidation and its reduction halves. Then you're going to balance the half reactions in a specific manner. The first thing you do is you're going to balance every other element that's not hydrogen or oxygen. So if you have sulfur, phosphorus, manganese, whatever it is, you balance those first using traditional balancing techniques. Then you balance the oxygens by adding water 
And then you further balance the waters because the, uh, assuming that if you add water, it'll make it uneven in hydrogens, you add hydrogen to the opposite side to make that balance. So you're adding water and hydrogen to balance the equation. It's kind of weird, but um, because you're switching, you're uh, moving electrons over um, from one element to another, and this is most of the time in an aqueous solution, water is involved. That's why we have to add these elements and add these, add water in there. The solvent plays a role in redox. And then you're going to balance the charges by adding electrons. That's key as well. Then you're going to multiply the half reaction by the number of electrons you need to make them equal. I'll show you that. And then you're going to add them up and cancel out like terms. So it seems like there's a lot, but let's just do a couple of examples and it hopefully it'll get easier over time. Okay. So the first one we'll do together. The second one, I will ask for your help for every step. And the third one you'll do on your own. So the first one we have, we got our first assign oxidation states. So let's find for manganese. So manganese, this is permanganate ion my, minus one oxygen oxidation state is minus two minus two times four is minus eight. So we have minus eight manganese plus minus eight equals negative one. That means manganese must be plus seven, right? Because the total, when you add up the oxidation states of the manganese and the oxygen, they have to equal negative one because this permanganate ion is negative one. So the manganese is going to be plus seven. The iodine, very easy one. It's monatomic by itself. It's minus one. I2. Now uh, I'll, I'll let you answer this one. What's the oxidation state of this iodine? Zero. Good. Good. Good job, Tariq. Because if you have an element that's by itself with no charge, in this case, this is a diatomic gas, it will be zero. And the manganese, it tells us it's plus two. Okay. Next step is to determine what is being oxidized or reduced. Now it's not balanced because there's no oxygen on the right. So we'll get to that in a second. Manganese going from plus seven to plus two. Therefore it's reduced. So we'll write reduced. And we'll write that half reaction as MnO4 minus yields Mn2 plus. Then the oxidizing, well, I'll write ox, is going to be negative one to zero for the iodines. So it'll be I minus yields I2. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, how come the um, oxidation reaction is the is the iodine if it didn't gain an oxygen? Good, good question. Okay, so for the definitions of oxidation and reduction, there are three definitions for each oh, one. Is it because the um, the number of elements increases? Not number of elements. Okay, so for oxidation, it means either gaining of oxygen one of the other things can happen. So gaining of oxygen is one thing that, that, that doesn't, ha doesn't happen here. A losing of hydrogen, that doesn't happen here either with the iodine, but a gaining of oxidation number. I'll put oxid, oxid, whatever, ox number. So I'll put it this way. In order for you to see oxidation, one of these three things must happen. Something must, and in most of the case, I say 95% of the case cases, the oxidation number is increased, but other one, the either a gaining of oxygens or a decrease in hydrogens can also occur. So I would say the main thing to go off of is assigning oxidation states and seeing what the oxidation number does. Does it increase? If it does, it's oxidized. If it decreases, it's reduced. Does that clear it up? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Now for reduction, here you see like a two-pronged thing because reduction, the three definitions are a decrease in oxygen, an increase in hydrogen, so basically the opposite of oxidation, and then a decrease in oxidation number. 
Now, for manganese that's being reduced, we see two of those things. We see a decrease in oxidation number, and we see a decrease in oxygen. So that just goes to show you that it doesn't only have to be one of these things. It could be two of them. Sometimes it's all three, but that's rare also. But if you see one of these things happen, therefore, or then it's oxidation or it's reduction, depending on what happens. Okay, so very good question. All right, so now let's balance it. So we're going to balance it, the oxidation half, by first balancing the non-hydrogen or oxygen elements, which there are none. So we just put a two right here. And then let's look at the steps. Add H2O and O, or sorry, and H plus to balance H and O. There are none, so we're going to skip that. Add electrons to balance the charge. We could do that because the charge is unequal. 2 iodine minus, that means there's two minus charges here, and there's zero here. So we can add two electrons to the right side. Any questions there? No? Okay. Now I should have left more room for the second one. Oh no, I don't want to delete everything. Okay. We'll just rewrite it. All right. So for the manganese one, this is the reduction half. We need to balance out the manganeses, done. Balance out the oxygens now by adding water. So there's four oxygens on the left. So that means we need to add four water molecules to the right. What this does is now we need to balance out the hydrogens. There's eight hydrogens on the right. Therefore, we add, and I'm going to rewrite it here, MnO4 minus plus 8H plus yields Mn2 plus plus 4H2O. We added the eight hydrogens in order to balance the hydrogens from the water that we just added. Okay, any questions here? That's the, the big difference between, or one of the big differences between traditional balancing and this. No? Okay. Now we need to add electrons. So we need to see what the charge is on the left and the right. So the charge on the left is plus seven because you have eight H pluses and you have one minus. So that's going to be plus seven. On the right, we have plus two. So the difference here is plus five. There's a, there's a five difference. Which side do the five electrons go? The left or the right? Left, good. Because we need to decrease this plus seven by five in order to make it plus two. Then they'll be equal. So we can put five E minus plus the rest of the reaction like that. Okay. Are there any questions there on how I got the, either the oxidation I, half or the reduction half? I have a question with the reduction half. Sure. Um, I guess in terms of adding the um, hydrogens and water, so those don't affect the oxidation numbers in terms of comparing the charges on the left and on the right? No, because, well, water is neutral. So, it is, so it, we're talking about for the, when we add the electrons, that's a total charge of the left or the right side. Now, since water is a neutral charge, meaning there, H is plus one and O is minus two, it doesn't mm -hmm. contribute to the total charge of one side. But on the left side, the hydrogens? Right, because we're adding hydrogen ions. Because they, the hydrogens themselves have an oxidation of plus one. And we're just adding them to balance out the hydrogens from the right. Okay. Okay. It'll make more sense once we practice it. Um, all right. So now we see the oxidation half has two electrons on the right. The reduction half has five electrons on the left. We got to multiply it. See, it says multiple number six, step six, multiply equation to cancel out electrons. What are, which one are we multiplying and what do we do? What do you guys think?
Any ideas? We need to make the bottom one even. That's a good start. Good. So we need to make the reduction one. We'll make it even so that we can multiply the one with two electrons to make them equal number of electrons. So we'll multiply the reduction half by two. So it'll be 10 electrons plus 2MnO4 minus plus 16. Oh, no. Oh, no. It, oh, no. OK, we'll get it. I hate when it does that. It does that randomly. No. Why? Really? Oh. That's sad. I have a picture of the majority of the work that you did so far. If you want me to just email it to you. No, it's okay. Um, I could. Okay. So I know where I was at. Right, thank you though. I really appreciate it. All right. All right. So we get the oxidation half is going to be, oh, you could just read out to me. So what's the oxidation half right now? The oxidation half is two I negative. Mm -hmm. It goes to, I2 plus 2E negative. Okay, good. And the reduction half is... And do you want it with or without the electrons? With the electrons. It's 5E negative mm -hmm. plus MnO4 negative plus mm -hmm. H plus. And it goes to Mn2 plus plus 4H2O. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Extra credit for you. All right. So um, Tariq, yeah, basically like a system of equations, kind of. Um, but you're trying to make them, make the electrons cancel out because the goal here is in a chemical reaction, you don't want to show electrons. So with the reduction one, we're multiplying it by two. So it'll be 10 E minus plus two MnO4 minus plus 16 H plus yields two Mn2 plus plus eight H2O. And yeah, kind of like an elimination one. It's been a while since I've done that, but yeah, same thing. So that's the reduction. Then the oxidation, we'll put it down here and that'll be, oh, what are we gonna multiply it by? Here's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna save this. Okay, cool. Multiplying it by five, good, good. Multiplying it by five, and that's gonna give me 10 I minus yields five I two plus 10 electrons. And then we can see the 10 electrons from the reduction half cancel with the 10 electrons on the oxidation half. And all we do is add up the reactions. So we get two MnO4 minus plus 16H plus plus 10I minus yields 2Mn2 plus plus 8H2O plus 5I2. And look at that. We're done. Nice. All right. Any questions on that? Uh, this is not really a question, but at this point, the um, the electron, like the charges on both sides should be even, right? Like we don't have to repeat that step. Yes, they should be even. So here we have four on the right and we have minus 12 and plus 16, which is four on the right and the left. So we have four on the left, four on the right. So yeah, so it should be, the charges should be even, the electrons should be, or sorry, the uh, and the atoms should be even, charges and atoms. All right, and um, how would the question be phrased 
for this. So balance the following redox reaction. That's one way. Or they could be mean and not tell you it's a redox and it'd be balance the reaction. If you see charges in it, it's probably redox. If it's, if it's, if it's weird like this, it's probably redox. And another thing is, you notice how there's no oxygen on the right side at all. So even if you tried to balance it traditionally, you couldn't do it. So that means something else is going on, which means redox. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next one. All right, so um, we'll do this one still together, but I'll ask for your help. All right, so what is the oxidation state of sulfur? The way I say it, it's minus two for oxygen, but there are three of them, so minus six total. But if, so if you say, um, just for um, terminology's sake, if someone asks you, what's the oxidation state for oxygen? Negative six is wrong. It's negative two. The total number of oxygens have an oxidation state of negative six. So just to clarify. Okay, anyway. So for sulfur, what do we got? Plus four, that seems right. You have minus six. So four plus minus six equals minus two. That's good. Yeah, S would be plus four because there's only one of them. Right. Um, okay, now this oxygen, still minus two. All the oxygens are minus two because there's no peroxides here. Uh, what about the manganese? What's the manganese? The, the first manganese. Plus seven, yep, plus seven. So it's gonna be minus eight. So seven plus minus eight equals negative one. Uh, what about this sulfur? And that one's also gonna be, well, not also, what is that gonna be? Six, good, plus six. Because you have plus six, minus eight, negative two. And this manganese, it tells you it's gonna be plus two. So which element is oxidized? meaning the oxidation number goes up. Really, manganese? Oxidized. Sulfur, good. Sulfur, sulfur. You see how it goes from plus four to plus six. So we're going to write our oxidation half reaction as SO3 two minus yields SO4 two minus. And then our reduction half is going to be the manganese because it goes from plus seven to plus two. MnO4 minus yields Mn2 plus. Okay. Any questions on this so far? How we got the half reactions? No? All right. So for the oxidation, what do we do first? How do we balance this one first? Add H2O to the left. Good. So you're going to, uh, I'm going to do this. I'll do this. H2O plus. There we go. So H2O plus. So now we balanced the number of oxygens. There's four on the left, four on the right. But now we need to balance something else. What do we do now? Add H2 on the right. Well, 2H plus, but I get, I see what you're saying. So 2H plus, good. All right, so now the charges are not equal. So what do we do for that? The left side has minus two. The right side has zero. So we're gonna add electrons, correct, but to which side? Good, two electrons to the right, awesome. Cool, cool. So now we're done there because the, the charges are now equal and the number of atoms are equal. Nice. Now manganese's turn. So what are we going to do here? Add 2H2 to the right. Not two of them, four of them. Good. Plus 4H2O. And then what?
Good. Then we're going to add eight hydrogen ions to the left because we want our, our hydrogens to be equal. And then what do we do? Think about our charges here. Left side, we have what? Plus seven. Our right side, we got plus two. Just like we did before. Hmm, are we going to add seven to the left? Five. Good. Okay. So we're going to add five electrons. Good, good, good. All right. Good job. Now, oh, it looks like it's a very similar problem with uh, the same. It's okay. Everyone has an off day. I'm off. I feel off today. All right, um, now what? What do we do? We have two electrons on the right side for equation one for the oxidation, five electrons on the left side for the second reaction. What are we gonna multiply the first one by? Five, good. What are we gonna multiply the second one by? Two, good. Awesome job. All right, so um, let's do that. Oh, I'll write them small. I'll write them a different color. So we're going to do it 5H2O plus 5SO3 2 minus yields 5SO4 2 minus plus 10H plus. And then for the reduction, we multiply it by 2. And also, oh, we have plus two electron or plus 10 electrons. For the reduction half, we have two MnO4 minus plus 16 H plus, like we did before, plus 10 electrons, which will cancel out, yields two Mn2 plus plus eight H2O. Electrons will cancel, and our final answer will be 5H2O plus 5SO3 2 minus plus 2MNO4 minus plus 16H plus yields 5SO4 2 minus plus 10H, not HE, H plus. H plus, this is long, plus 2MN2 plus. The waters and the hydrogen cancel each other out on the other side. So uh, they can. Different. Yeah, yeah, we can. So this would cancel out okay. and we can make these three. And then okay, I wasn't sure if I would be this like can cancel six. out. Yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry. So. You could do that. And this can make it six. So you could do that. Um, but it's better to learn it the full way and then you can get fancy when you get comfortable. So, okay, good. That does save you a little bit of space. And it's important to keep these very organized because it's very easy to forget a charge or to forget a coefficient or to forget a molecule because we're writing a law, we're adding two reactions and it's, you go slow with it is what I'm trying to say. Uh, okay, any questions? Okay, so let's do one more, and this time you're gonna do it. And first, so we balance it. Can you go back really quickly? Of course. Like finish taking my notes. Sure, sure, sure. So there's another nuance to it, which we can balance these equations in basic environments and acidic environments. Now, question: the one we just, the two we just did, are they in basic environments? or acidic environments? And it, this isn't a trick question. It, it is one of them. And if so, how would you tell? Acidic, good. How would you tell? Cuz H plus, perfectly set. Because in our final reaction, we have H plus ions. And what do they signify? They mean there's an acid or there is an acidic environment. So that's perfect. 
Now, if we were to put them in a basic environment, all we need to do is add more water molecules. Exactly, OH. Or we're not, we're not really add, add more OH to make them water molecules. That's what I meant. I'm off my game today. So here we have six H plus. All we need to do is add six OH minus to this side, and we can add six OH minus to this side. And what that would do is it would make six waters. These three waters would cancel out, and this would become three waters, and then you'd have six OHs. That would be in a basic environment. So if that didn't make any sense, we're going to do an example with that now. All right, is everybody done copying? Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to give you five minutes to do this one. So first balance it in an acidic environment, which is the normal way that we've just done it. And then if you want, you can balance it in the basic environment. So by adding the OH to both sides and then condensing it further. And we'll do that one together if you're not sure. But definitely try it right now to balance the whole thing. All right, let's assign oxidation states. Uh, so chromium, what do we got for the first chromium? Plus 12. I don't know about that. I don't know about plus 8. Plus 6. Good, plus 6. Together, they're plus 12. But just each chromium is plus 6. We got the oxygen. They're always minus 2. The oxygen here, minus 2. Hydrogens are plus 1. So what does that make the first carbon? Minus 2. Good. Chromium here is plus three. Oxygen here is minus two. And what's carbon? Second carbon. Good. Plus four. Awesome. So what is being oxidized? Good. So carbon technically is being oxidized. And, and look, see, remember the three definitions of oxidation. We're doing two of those, or three of those. We're doing all three in this case. We are removing hydrogens because the carbon has less hydrogens here. We're adding an oxygen, and we're increasing the oxidation number. So all three of those things are occurring at the same time. Then uh, chromium, by process of elimination, is being reduced from plus six to plus three. And look, it's losing oxygen. So, And also, it's losing oxidation number. So that goes hand in hand. All right, so the oxidation half is going to be C2H5OH, which happens to be ethanol. Okay, so we'll look at that. So we'll do uh, C2H5OH, and then that yields CO2. All right, so let's balance the oxygens. What do we do first? So what's the first step here? H2O on the left, good. And we're gonna only add one of them. So H2O, we'll rewrite the equation. H2O plus C2H5OH yields CO2. Now what do we do? Oh, you got to balance the carbon. Whoops. And then we add two of them. Nice. Good. Wait, how many oxygen? We have four oxygens here, one oxygen here, three, three waters. Yes. Good catch. See, I'm off my game today. Okay, that's right. All right. So now um, we're going to add eight hydrogens. Let's see. We have one, we have five. Let me add more than that. So we have six here, and then we also have six here. So that means we need to add 12 H pluses to the right side. Uh, professor, why, why is it two CO2? Oh, because we need to balance the carbons first. 
the, we need to balance the non-hydrogen or oxygen atoms first. Oh, okay. Okay, so now we have the H pluses. Now we, the charges are not equal. There's plus 12 on this side and there's zero on the left. So what do we do? Good, we're gonna add 12 electrons to the right. Okay, so now we're done here. The charges are equal. Now let's work on the reduction half. So the reduction half is going to be Cr2O7 2 minus yields Cr3 plus. Okay, what's the first step? Balance the CRs. Good, make a two right there. Then what? Add seven waters to the right. Awesome. Seven H2O. That's the, to balance out the oxygens. Then what? Add seven hydrogens. I'm not sure about seven. 14. Good. 14 hydrogens. Plus 14 H plus. Because there's 14 hydrogens in those waters. It's okay. All right, so now what's the next step? Now we're going to talk about charges. Charges on the right is plus six. Charges on the left, 14 minus two plus 12. So what do we got to do here? Good, six electrons to the left side. Okay. All right. So now we have the balanced oxidation and redox or redox uh, half reactions. What do we do? The second equation multiplied by two. Good. Cause we have 12 electrons in the top one, six electrons in the bottom one on opposite sides. So we multiply the bottom equation by two and then we add them up. So we're gonna do all of that in one step. And I'll write the answer down here. And it's gonna be acidic conditions. All right, so the first one, and no, we add six electrons to the left. All right, so um, the charge on the left is not zero. The charge on the left is 14 plus minus two. So that's gonna be minus 12. Charge on the right is plus six. So to make the plus 12 back down to plus six, we add six electrons to the left. Okay, so I'm gonna write the acidic conditions. So I'm gonna add these up. So you have three H2O plus C2 H5OH plus we're multiplying this equation by two. So it's gonna be 28 H plus plus two Cr2O7, two minus. The electrons will cancel. So I'm not gonna write those. And then the right side, 2CO2 plus 12H plus plus 2Cr3 plus plus 7H2O. Okay, then the H2Os, we can get some cancellation going on. So the three H2Os cancel. This becomes a four. And then the H pluses, the 12, 12 cancels. And this becomes... 16. Okay, so that's for balancing it in acidic conditions. Are there any questions there? The last step of canceling out? Okay, so the reason why I canceled things out is because just like algebra, 
they were, they were on common the left and the right side. So the waters, there was seven waters here and three on the left, seven on the right, three on the left, the three on the left canceled out. The seven on the right became just four on the right. The hydrogen, same thing. You had ended up with 28 on the left and what was it? 12. There was 12 on the right. Oh, there was 14 on the left. Wait, no, we multiplied it by two. There's 28. Oh, wait, 14 waters. Yes, there were 14 waters. Correct. Oh, there should be four. Whoops. Okay. You're right. You're right. This should be four. This is why it's very important to, to check your work. Um, then it'll be 14 minus three, 11. No, nope, 14 minus. Yeah. 14 minus three, 11, 11 waters. Okay. Thank you for checking me. Sumi. Good job. Okay. Um, now, are there any questions on it? No. Okay. If not, then I think we're good to go and move on. I'll make sure to save it so we can save the annotations. Okay. All right. Let's continue. All right, electrical current. So I'm not, I'm not going to go crazy. You can go as a physicist, as someone, if you do physics, you can go in crazy detail about current. But in chemistry, we're going to talk about it briefly. So current is the movement of, an electrons, through the, of electrons through the wire, through a wire. And we could move electrons between atoms, which is a redox, and we can change the states of the atoms in that fashion. So if we put zinc into copper sulfate, right? So copper sulfate is an electrolytic solution and copper has its own reduction potential, which we'll learn about reduction potential, what that is. And so does zinc. What will happen is zinc will be oxidized because zinc has a much lower reduction potential than copper does. Copper will reduce. And when it reduces, it will become a solid again. It will go from copper two plus to copper neutral and copper solid. And that's what's happening here. You see the copper two plus in solution will go to copper solid. Then the copper particles will be stripped out of the solution and they will go and become uh, crystals, metal crystals on the zinc metal. Meanwhile, the zinc will go in solution because zinc will oxidize. It'll go from zinc solid to zinc two plus. So that's what we're going to be observing when we talk about these galvanic cells well, that's and voltaic cells. Those are the same thing, but we'll be talking about those next. Any questions on that concept of what's happening here? And that's a spontaneous reaction. The reason why it's spontaneous is because of these standard reduction potentials. And we'll talk about those in a minute. So current is the amp, which means the one coulomb of charge per second is an amp of current. And one amp is one coulomb of charge is the is uh, 6.242 times 10 to the 18th electrons. So one coulomb is this many electrons. One coulomb per second, this many electrons per second. If that's needed in any homework problems, you can refer to this. If it's needed on an exam, you'll be given the information. So now the most important thing is this potential difference. And we measure it in volts. Now the potential difference means the, the difference in potential energy, obviously, between the products and reactants or between what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. The larger the voltage, the more charge that's involved. So the more energy too. So one volt is one joule of energy per coulomb of charge. So what that means is that the more voltage, the more potential difference you have between oxidation and reduction, the stronger the, the battery is, the more power it can give, because it means that it gives you more joules of energy per coulomb of charge. So the electrons were there, therefore, um, the electron flow per electron will give you more energy. And this is, and this is the voltage is needed to drive the electrons through. So that means basically the, um, the electron gradient, that's what's needed to drive the electron movement. 
And in general, they're called electromotive forces, EMFs. And in physics classes and analytical chem, you go, you go more in depth about those. But there's a standard EMF, which is our um, standard cell potential, which is in standard conditions, meaning 25 degrees Celsius, one molar for concentrations, one ATM for gases. So um, that's a standard cell potential, which is given to you on a table. Um, but before that, we'll do this question. So which statement best captures the difference between volts and amps? All right, so I'll let you guys read them and let me know what you think. And we have some A's. Yep, A is the answer. Good. So a volt is a unit that quantifies a difference in electrical potential. Good. So the larger the volts, the larger the energy that this system gives. And the amp is the unified unit that quantifies the flow. Good. All right. So we have our electrochemical cells. We'll just show you so there's three main components of the electrochemical cell. And before I show you the diagram, I'll tell you about them. The first is the anode. And here's some, some key definitions here. Anode, oxidation. Anode, oxidation. Remember that. And also negative, because that's what the electrons are. All right. So how do I remember that? The way I remember it is anode starts with an A, which is a vowel. And oxidation starts with an O, which is a vowel. Anode oxidation. Cathode is a consonant. So is reduction. So is R in reduction. Cathode reduction. Anode oxidation, cathode reduction. Because it's negative. The anode's negative because what is it doing? It's oxidizing. It is losing electrons, which means originally it has electrons to lose and give to the reduction side, which is positive. And the electrons flow from negative to positive spontaneously. We can force them in the other direction in an electrolytic cell, but that's a different story. Oh, what I just did here. So let's see, anode, anion, negative. Oxidation is lost. Yeah, that's another way. That's good too. And then the salt bridge, what the salt bridge is, is just a, a bridge to kind of balance out the ionic charges because we don't want to have charges that aren't from electrons just just to have like um charged ions we don't want to have a, an ionic gradient between both half cells and what, here's what we mean by half cells so here's a voltaic cell here's a standard notation and, and diagram for it and here's the, the basic one between zinc and copper now, zinc is the anode. It's negative. That's where oxidation is occurring because it spontaneously oxidizes when it's paired up with copper because copper likes to spontaneously reduce when it's with zinc. The way we know that is we compare the standard reduction potentials, which we'll get to. And yes, electrons go from anode to cathode because A becomes before C. So A goes to C. That's another way, good way to remember it. There's a lot of good ways to remember it. So good job. Um, all right, so anode to cathode, good. And here you have the salt bridge in the middle. Um, you have the oxidation half, the reaction, and the reduction half, you have the reaction also. Okay, so we'll, we'll go into this. Here we go. So in a voltaic cell, in which direction do electrons flow? What do we think? Not that straightforward. Not C. A, good. So they always go from, so higher potential energy. Now the potential energy, we already made a comparison between potential energy, cell potential, and voltage. So that's what that is. So the potential difference is the difference in potential energy between the anode and the cathode. So the anode should always have a higher, or I'm sorry, it should always have a higher um, 
potential energy, not always reduction. It gets kind of complicated talking about it like that. But um, and in in life, just think about this way: in science, things like to go from higher potential energy to lower. In in energy, in, in any bond that forms, it goes from higher energy to lower energy. That any bond that forms spontaneously. And keep in mind, in a voltaic cell, voltaic cells are spontaneous. The reduction in the oxidation occurs spontaneously. All right. So there is this notation. There's a cell notation. And it could get complicated, but but you don't need to like pick it apart too much. Um, but just under we need to understand what it means. And it's in the exact format as the diagram where you have oxidations on the left, reductions on the right, anodes on the left, cathode on the right. So let's look at an example. Or let's look at the definitions first, then we'll look at an example. So the oxidation is going to be on the left, reductions on the right, and we're separated by two vertical lines. These two vertical lines represent the salt bridge. The single line means it separates a solid and an aqueous. So usually you have the metal and then you have a solution that the metal is in. So we're going to have the metal is going to be the electrode. The solution that the metal is in is in the electrolyte. And then it'll be the opposite for the reduction side. So here's, where we, here's an example of that. So here we have two electrodes. We have the anode is going to be iron. The cathode is platinum. In the solution, we have iron, iron ions. So and on the on the oxidation side. So it's gonna what the notation is you put the electrode, which is the iron electrode, single line, whatever's in the solution. It could be iron, it could be 10 different things. So in this case, it's iron, iron plus, iron two plus. Then the salt bridge, because that's all that's on the oxidation side. And then we do the reduction side, which is all of the ions, the electrolytes which is the, uh, the permanganate, the manganese 2 plus, and the hydrogen plus. And then the cathode um, electrode, which is the platinum. So that is how you draw the standard potential or the cell notation. Will you be asked to do this? Probably not, because it's very difficult to do on an exam. But will you be asked to know what it means and maybe um, interpret it by given this which species is being oxidized, for example? And the answer would be the Fe2 plus will be oxidized to become Fe. Or sorry, the Fe will be oxidized to become Fe2 plus. So that, that may be a thing. OK, any questions on that? No? OK, next. Standard reduction potential. Now we're going to learn about the numbers, which are very important. So the standard reduction potential for the hydro for the reduction of hydrogen of H plus to H2, we will standardize that as zero, zero volts. Because that's what hydrogen is always a standard. So it's zero volts. Everything relative to that to that determines what something will do in the presence of a hydrogen electrode. So for example, if we have zinc, zinc's potential is negative 0.76 volts. And these are standard reduction, reduction potentials. So what that means is that zinc has a lower standard reduction potential, meaning it doesn't like to be reduced. It likes to be oxidized. So in the, in the presence of H plus, zinc, if you have a, an H plus and a zinc electrode, the zinc will be the one that's oxidized. The H plus will be reduced because the H plus has a higher reduction potential. So here's an example of that, exactly that with the zinc. So the anode, the uh, point, the negative 0.76 volts, that's the reduction potential of the zinc. Because it's so low, it's going to be oxidized. The cathode, or it's going to be oxidized, which makes it the anode. The cathode will be the reduction side, which will be the reduction of hydrogen plus, because it has a higher 
potential, a higher reduction potential. So here's a good, this bullet point, I guess kind of makes sense. So when the, when two half cells are connected, the electrons will flow so that the half reaction with the stronger tendency will occur. I don't like that at all. Never mind. That's stupid. Nope. Just if you remember what I said, that makes sense. So the one with the higher reduction potential will be reduced. That's it. Don't even think about higher in terms of number or, or in terms of uh, magnitude. Think of just the number itself. So zero is higher than negative. 0.76. Therefore, the reduction will be the H plus. Okay. So in this case, looking at these two, we have hydrogen is zero and copper is 0.34. So which way Will it, will it go? So which way will, um, under, well, this diagram is kind of, they're saying going the opposite way would be spontaneous, but so, um, let's, let's answer, ask this question, copper and hydrogen in this system with having copper and hydrogen and these different potentials. Which one of them is more likely to be reduced? Just answer that. We'll go one step at a time. Copper or hydrogen? Copper. So copper has a higher reduction potential. The number is higher, 0.34, positive 0.34. That's higher. Therefore, copper will most likely, if this was a spontaneous reaction, it likes to be reduced. So it would go from copper two plus, plus two E to copper. But in this case, they're saying, if you want to go the opposite direction of what's natural, it will be a non-spontaneous reaction, which we know that because you'd have to put in energy for that to happen. That's all they're saying here. And this is why, remember we saw the diagram with the zinc and the copper, where is it? This one, the zinc and the copper. So the zinc is going to be the anode. I said, because it likes to be the anode. And here's why it likes to be the anode because zinc's potential, or this is, so this is, um, this is flipped. So this is the oxidation of zinc. It's plus 0.76. This is the oxidation of copper. It's negative 0.34 the higher oxidation potential, just like reduction potential, is the one that likes to be oxidized the, mo the most. The lower one is the one that likes to be reduced. So I can see what this is getting, this is getting confusing to you guys because so this, this number right here is an oxidizing, oxid, oxidizing potential. So the reduction potential for RP for zinc is negative 0.76. The oxidation potential OP is plus 0.76. This means that if you flip the sign of the reduction potential, you get the oxidation potential. So that, that's something that you can do. Okay. Are there any confusions? Cause I feel like I've just like rattling off stuff and is, it's kind of confusing. No. Okay. So let's look at the chart. Okay. A little confused. All right. All right. Let's look at the chart. Okay. So here's the chart and there's two parts of it, right? And here's your standard hydrogen. These numbers are the standard numbers given on the table. This table is your, your Bible for this chapter, right? For lack of better terms, your, your guide for this chapter. The volts, the are the volts are reduction potentials. The higher this number is, not not absolute value, just the higher it is, 
the more likely something like the more likely it is to be reduced. That's that's it. So if I have gold three plus and I have dichromate right here. So I have gold, dichromate. Gold is 1.5. Dichromate is 1.3. Gold will be reduced. Dichromate will be oxidized. It's all based on the reduction potentials. Any questions on that concept? That's the so main way you interpret high, numbers. So higher reduction potential means it gets reduced. Higher oxidation number or potential means it gets oxidized. Right. But I, wouldn't, I would say don't even focus on the oxidation potential. It's just the flip sign. So think about it this way. The higher reduction, the, the table you're going to get is always reduction potentials. The higher reduction potential, it's going to be reduced. The lower one, it's going to be oxidized. The reason why I mentioned the term oxidation potential, which I shouldn't have, is because this example used it. This example flipped, they flip flop stuff and they didn't really explain it well. So I try to fill in that gap. But in reality, we can figure out all the answers for everything if you don't worry about oxidation potential. But it is the negative of the reduction potential. All right. So again, these numbers are reduction potentials. If you want to see if a reaction happens spontaneously or not, or um, what's going to be oxidized, what's going to be reduced, look at these potentials if you have different metals. So if you have, or different, different uh, substances. So copper plus one to copper. The reduction potential is 0.5. If you pair that with chromium three plus to chromium to chromium solid, negative 0.73, the copper is 0.52. That will be reduced. It is a higher number. The chromium will be oxidized. It is a lower number. That's about it. Any questions on that? And the next question would be, next skill, is how do you determine what the voltage is for that voltaic cell that has both of those in it? And the answer, you subtract the one that's being reduced minus the one that's being oxidized. Or you, meaning you subtract the reduction potentials of each one and you will always get a positive number. And that's very important that you always get a positive number also, or else it's not spontaneous. And we'll see that. So an electrode has a negative electrode potential. That's what we just talked about. Um, which, which statement, or so, well, it's just saying one electrode. So it's, an, it's negative, meaning the reduction potential. Which statement is correct regarding the potential energy of the electron at this electrode? An electron at this electrode has a lower potential energy than it has at a standard hydrogen electrode. The standard hydrogen is zero. The electrode is negative. So does it have a lower reduction or a higher reduction potential? Yes, lower. Boom. Okay. I don't like the wording of this question. A little confusing. But anyway, um, here's the real... Oh, sure. Okay. Um, all right. So... The electrode has a negative electrode potential. All right, so we're here. This is a good chart. All right, so we're one of these. Manganese, negative. It's saying that which statement is correct? So an, an electron at this electrode, meaning the manganese, has a lower potential energy than it has at the standard hydrogen electrode. 
Okay. So the standard hydrogen electrode has a reduction potential that's higher, meaning it's more likely to be reduced. If something is being oxidized, which is this negative one, the, the, the negative electrode, the potential energy of it is going to be higher. And we've seen that. So if you look at here, hold on, this is the, this one. Yep, this one. So um, potential energy of electrodes that are further away from zero are going to be higher. So it's saying compared to zero, it has more potential. It has, um, hold on, let me see. Well, because it's, wait, hold on. That doesn't make any sense. I don't like the wording of this. So the standard hydrogen electrode is going to be reduced and the negative one is going to be oxidized. Therefore, it should have a higher potential energy. Hmm. I don't like the wording here. They should mean lower, if they mean, they should mean lower reduction potential. I think they mean lower reduction potential. If that's the case, then it's right. But I don't like the I don't like the word. Okay, let's just not get let's not get, let's not get hung up on it. So we'll say it's a reduction potential. Okay, so here's the important stuff. To figure out the voltage of a voltaic cell with both electrodes, you have the cathode and you have the anode. You know which one's being reduced and you know which one's being oxidized based on their potentials. To figure out the standard cell potential, which is the E0 cell, it's the cathode reduction potential minus the anode reduction potential. That's it. And it's always going to be positive if it's spontaneous. So for example, if you had chromium 3 plus to chromium, and aluminum three plus to aluminum solid. So chromium, so this one, the, the negative 0.73 and the negative 1.66. What is the chromium gonna do? Is it gonna be oxidized or reduced? Not oxidized. It's going to be reduced because the reduction potential is a higher number. It's less negative. So don't think about absolute values. Just think, no, no, no. So the chromium, oh yeah, yeah. Chromium, negative 0.73. Aluminum, negative 1.66. The higher one in the chart is going to be reduced. Reduction potential. Yes, exactly. It's less negative. Then the aluminum, it's lower. It's more negative. It's going to be oxidized. So in order to figure out the standard cell potential of a cell that has both of those metals, we do the reduction one, negative 0.76 minus the other one, minus the aluminum, which is going to be minus minus, in other words, plus 1.66. And the answer is 0.9. Therefore, it's positive, meaning it's spontaneous. Exactly. Good. If it's negative, which can happen in, in electrolytic cells, that means you need an, a DC power source for it to have, for it to work. You plug it in the wall, basically. Can't happen on its own. Okay. Cool. And you do not multiply these equations and the cell potentials. Cell potentials are intensive properties, meaning they don't, they're not uh, changed by the, the, the amount of matter involved. 
So you just, they are what they are. Okay, so here's just summarize, his words summarizing what I just said. Higher on the table means it's a stronger tendency to be reduced. Lower on the table, stronger tendency to be oxidized. That's it. Okay. So furthermore, if it's listed at the top of the table, that means they're better at reduction, which means they're good oxidizing agents. Lower on the table, good at, re good at being oxidized, good reducing agents. Remember that, that flip-flop. <clears throat> and then based on, let's say, copper and zinc, we know the spontaneous direction, which zinc is going to be oxidized, copper is going to be reduced because copper has a higher reduction potential. But if we flip them, and make we force zinc to be reduced, which it doesn't like to do, it will be a non-spontaneous reaction, meaning it will go against the natural gradient of the reduction potentials. So this is what we're used to, this one, and this is what the opposite, which is not gonna be good for spontaneity. Does that make sense? Yes, so you have the input energy to this one. So this one would work in a voltaic cell if you plugged it in the wall. And you can force zinc to be reduced. Okay. So um, we're almost we're almost halfway done. We'll we'll do this and we'll do some examples, I think. And we'll talk about delta G. Yeah, we'll talk about delta G and then that's it. All right. Okay. So we can predict which metals will dissolve in acid. And it's pretty cool. Okay, can the reduction potential be positive? Yeah, yes. Yeah, of course. So um, there's two parts of the chart, charts, remember? So there's the negative part and then there's the positive part. So the total, the total potential for the cell has to be positive in order for, the, for it to be spontaneous. If it's negative, that means it's not spontaneous. The opposite of Gibbs, which makes it more complicated, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about their relationship soon. Okay. So predicting whether a metal will dissolve in, in an acid. Okay. Some metals will, some metals won't, depending on the acid. Now, what does dissolving an acid or dissolving a metal mean? That means the metal goes from, let's say it's iron, goes from its solid to its Fe, whatever, let's say it's two plus aqueous. That's dissolving a metal because it goes from solid into the solution. In other words, it's being oxidized. In other words, it has a lower reduction potential. So metals whose reduction half reactions are listed below the reduction of, of H dissolve in acids. That's it right there. So it's oxidizing in any case where Fe becomes Fe2 plus and it's oxidized, meaning the whatever it's paired up with is higher in the table. That means it will dissolve. And for acids, we talk about H plus, right? From the reduction of H plus to H2, if every metal below that will dissolve in an acid, an acid, that's just general acids like HCl, HBr, HI. It's a little bit more complicated than that. For, so, but first, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Next, there's a special property about HNO3, which, and also maybe, a, and also um, sulfuric acid, but it'll be given in the table. Something like HNO3, nitric acid, a lot of metals dissolve in, in, in nitric acid. The reason why is because nitrate goes through its own reduction. So you have the reduction of the hydrogen, but it, nitrate also goes through its own reduction. And that reduction potential is pretty high. It's higher than zero. 
So that means more metals are going to be below that point on the chart, meaning they're going to be oxidized when in the presence of nitric acid. So let's sum this up into a question. Which metal dissolves in nitric acid, but not in HCl? So HCl is fairly simple. It dissolves into H plus and the Cl minus, right? Cl minus doesn't really get reduced that much. Or it's, it doesn't matter. Um, NO3, so we have the H plus, and we have the NO3 minus. NO3 minus has its own reduction. But how do we know that? By the chart. So let's just keep in mind, we have iron, gold, silver. So let's go back up. Let's find them. So let's find iron. We found gold. So gold is right here. So gold. Um, here's the NO3. Here's nitrate. See what I mean? It's more positive. It's 0.96. Here's silver. And there's not the iron we're looking for. So we're looking for iron dissolving, meaning a state transition from solid to, to aqueous. Here we have iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus. That doesn't do anything to its state. We want the other one. Not here. So it's probably here. There it is. Iron 3 plus plus 3 electrons to iron iron three minus or iron solid. And then we have the hydrogen potential. And then here's the other iron. Okay. Why does it matter that it dissolves? That's what the question is asking for. We're talking about which one dissolves in HNO3, but not HCl. Okay. Cool, cool. All right. So now dissolving, what does that mean? That means if it dissolves in H or if it dissolves in NO3 minus, that means it oxidizes in the presence of NO3 minus, meaning its reduction potential is lower. Oh, for the uh, irons that have the two phases, which one do we use? Um, they should specify, but here it doesn't matter. You might be given an example where they specify if they said like iron two plus, but yeah, they didn't specify here. Um, I'll show you why it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so if something dissolves in nitrate, in, in nitric acid, that means the reduction potential of that metal is lower than nitrate. So that means silver is lower. Gold, gold does not dissolve even in nitric acid. So that's good. That means it holds its value and you can't destroy someone's gold ring or, or gold necklace by dissolving it in nitric acid in the chem lab. So that's good. So that one won't dissolve in much. It'll dissolve in peroxide though, hydrogen peroxide, because hydrogen peroxide has a higher reduction potential. So, so you can learn a lot from these. And hydrogen peroxide is, is easier to buy. You can't just buy nitric acid. You can buy hydrogen peroxide at CVS. So... You could dissolve someone's gold that way. <laughs> Funny. All right. Um, okay. So we know our, our silver dissolves in our nitric acid. Now let's look at the other ones. Our iron will. Irons, both of them will. But the question is asking, which one dissolves in nitric acid but not in HCl? And HCl only goes through the simple reduction of hydrogen, which has the reduction potential of zero. So everything below this point, which is the irons, will dissolve in HCl. So that's not our answer. We're looking for which one doesn't dissolve in HCl. And the only one there is that's kind of between both reductions are, is a silver. Exactly. It's between both of them. It's lower than the nitric acid, meaning it'll dissolve, but it's higher than the H, meaning it won't dissolve in a simple a monatomic acid like HBr or HCl. So good question. The Cl, so let's see where Cl is. Cl minus. This is the reduction potential for Cl minus. 
Or no, it's not. The reduction potential for Cl2. If we flip it, so that means it's very likely to be reduced. If we flip it, that's the oxidation. It will have a, a very high likelihood to be oxidized. So that means it's going to be, it's, if you flip this reaction, the potential is going to be negative 1.33, which is all the way down here. So technically it does matter, but it's so low that it's going to be, it's not going to affect the other, it's not going to affect the dissolving of the other ones. Yeah, but the reason why nit nitrate's kind of in the middle, and so is like iodate. Um, what else we got? Any other acid? So here's sulfate. So sulfate's kind of in the middle also. So for this, for talking about if a metal dissolves in a certain acid, these are what you have to keep in mind. It's just comparing potentials. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, so why not? Why don't we talk about CL? Because so the reduction of CL minus would be so. This is so. This is the equation with CL minus. This one. This is the reduction of CL two. If you flip this, it'll be the reduction of Cl minus, which means the voltage will be negative 1.36. So that will be all the way down here. But if, if hydrogen dissolves, or if, so if, um, let me say it this way. If, high, if the presence of hydrogen, the reduction of hydrogen causes something to dissolve, then it dissolves. No matter, regardless of what the, regardless of what the CL is, it will still dissolve. So anything below the hydrogen, so let's put it this way. The nitrate, the nitric acid also has hydrogen. So why aren't we talking about hydrogen for that case too? Well, because anything below this point will dissolve in both of in, in the, the nitrate and in the H plus from the nitric acid, but it's already dissolved since the nitrate dissolves it. But in HCl, it's basically out of both of the components of the acid, the one that's higher up on the list you look at. Because anything below that point, it will already be dissolved. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Good question. Good question. Took me a second to, to explain it. Um, okay. We did this already. All right, so the answer is silver. Okay, because it's in the middle of both of them. All right, so the last thing we'll talk about is the relationship between E cell, delta G, and K. And here's like a good equation diagram for it. So a lot of it's just equations and just, I mean, equations will be given of course, but let's just get to the nitty gritty. Um, we know about spontaneity. So spontaneity, delta G is negative. Delta E has to be positive. And generally K is greater than one, meaning if you have a bunch of reactants, they're going to want to form products spontaneously until, the, until Q equals K, meaning until the reaction gets to its, um, where the products divided by the reactants are greater than one. Okay, so this is the three kind of conditions in their standard states. And the main relationship between Gibbs and the standard cell potential is negative N F E cell. So E cell, you know how to find. You do the reduction minus the oxidation, meaning the Whatever is being reduced, that reduction potential minus the reduction potential of the um, the oxidized one. So if K is greater than one, aren't products already greater? So the 
So if K is greater than one for a reaction, so okay, this is it. I see your confusion. It's saying that before the reaction begins, if we add NaCl and I don't know, something else, whatever, you add two things that are K is 10,000, right? When you add them together, the reason K is a set value at 10,000. So it didn't get to K yet. Q did not become K. At any instance of time, we can use the reaction quotient to quantify where the reaction is compared to its equilibrium. K is a standard definition of the reaction. What is K for this reaction? It's five. What does five mean? That means there's five times on average more products than reactants. Meaning if you put all the reactants together, it will go forward spontaneously until it reaches K. So K didn't already happen yet. Let me put it that way. Um, okay. So Delta G equals negative N F E or F yeah, F E. So N is number of electrons. Hold on. I got to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. This is my allergies today. Allergy last two days. Anyway. Um, all right. So F or N is number of electrons. F is a Faraday. So a Faraday's constant is the coulombs per mole of electrons. Again, that'll be given to you. And then your E cell, you know how to calculate. So that's how you find Gibbs. And then we have more equations. Um, so we can look at here and see this is called the Nernst equation, the one on the bottom, where we can quantify the E cell based on K and the number of electrons. And then we can go from G to K as well. So this is a little nifty table right there. And we're going to be using those on our worksheet. Okay. So before that, let's see, do a conceptual one. This is don't think about the new stuff. This is old stuff. Um, based on conceptual reasoning, which of the following best explains why I2 does not oxidize Br minus? What do we think? It doesn't have, to, doesn't have to do with reduction potential. And yes, A is the answer. Have you noticed that the answer is always A for this slideshow? I don't know why. But yeah, so bromine is more electronegative. It's higher up on the table. So it doesn't want to give up electrons to iodine that easily. Yep, it's A. All right, that's just like a refresher. That's a good review. All right, so here are some equations that I'm just going to throw at you. Um, so we have delta G, negative RT, natural log of K. So R is our 8.314 for our uh, gas constant. So that one's back for all of these. It's the 8.314 because we're talking about joules because Gibbs free energy is in joules um, here. So this is the nurse equation, which is this one on the bottom. And that's where we kind of, we derive, I'm not gonna go through derivations, um, but so we know that from the previous slide from the previous, from, from here, Delta G equals negative N F E. So Delta G, we also know, if we compare it to K equals negative RT ln of K. So then we could say that negative NFE equals negative RT natural log of K. And then we can f find the cell potential from that. And we get this equation. These are all basically the same equation. And here's just a little explanation of what the, of uh, what the variables mean, which one, what are, what are they? And Q, they use the term mass action expression, but it just means the um, reaction quotient.
And for the second equation, yes, you can just take away negative signs. K is 8.3. No, 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 no. Um, R, yes, R is 8.314. Okay, then if you substitute R and F, because R and F are constants, remember? And also if you say it's at standard condition, meaning our temperature is 25 Celsius or 298 Kelvin, you can come up and you, you can convert to the log and you get this equation, which is getting from K and the number of electrons, you can get the cell potential. So these, these equations are the same thing, but this one's in standard conditions. And again, all these will be given to you. So don't freak out about just giving you all these equations. We, but in the homework, you'll be, you'll be training how to use them all. Um, okay, so we'll do one more example. Oh, I just gave it away. Whoops. And you can get that from the reduction. Yeah, you can get, you can get E cell from the, the difference in reduction potentials. So sometimes they might ask you, find what is K? if you're using a zinc and copper cell. So if that's the case, you're like, all right, if the zinc is being oxidized, then the copper is being reduced. So you do the copper minus the copper minus the zinc, put that into here. You know how many electrons there are by the equation. And then you solve for K. So that's totally valid. Um, all right, so a redox reaction is an equilibrium constant of 1.2 times 10 to the third. So it's very, very high. Which statement is true regarding delta G and E cell for this reaction? So if it's, if K is positive, what does that mean generally? If you just throw the reactants in there, is it going to be spontaneous in the positive, in the forward direction or what? Well, yeah, C, because you kind of saw me do that. But it's going to be spontaneous, meaning delta G is negative. And also that means E is positive. So that's what that means. 